Yeah, okay, great. All right. Um, so thank you very much for that warm uh, introduction. It's probably overstated a little bit, Cameron. Um, but uh, it's actually lovely to uh, be back in the PS sphere. Um, I haven't been to a conference for a few years. Um, we had the opportunity to move down here two and a half years ago uh, to work on this project. And um, we kind of haven't been back to Perth all that often. So um, it's great to reconnect with some of my colleagues and to see some, hopefully meet some new colleagues as well today. Um, but it's, it's my very great pleasure to present this project because it, it probably cl most closely aligns with any with with the, the the sort of values that I hold as a designer and a planner um, compared to any other project I've worked on. So um, when when we uh, we first met Mike and um, uh, had the opportunity to to come and work on the project, I think the the first meeting was in September, and by December we had sold our house, taken our kids out of schools, and my wife had also had a job offer. Um, from Mike as the marketing communications manager. So it was kind of like, it didn't take very long to, uh, to make that decision and we came down and we really haven't looked back. Um, it's a lovely region to live in um, and uh, the project is, is a great project to work on. So it's the kind of project that gets you out of, out of bed very enthusiastically just about every day. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to present the project um, and uh, I'll go through it now. So um, the format of the presentation, um, it's a long presentation, so bear with me. Um, uh, but hopefully there's, there's lots of graphics and um, hopefully it'll be interesting. Um, I'm going to take you on a little excursion before I get into the proper case study. Um, and that excursion is going to set the context for why I think eco-villages are important um, in a broader sense. So um, give me 10 minutes to go down that journey and I'll come back to the actual case study and we'll go through and give you all the detail. And then at the end of it, um, I'll talk about uh, what's happening on site right now. You can see some photos and it's, it's all pretty exciting. Um, so that's the sort of format. So we'll, we'll start off um, with uh, that journey. So we'll go on the first slide. So this is essentially the why of an eco-village. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Simon Sinek's um, uh, quotes around that. Um, the people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Um, so I want to give you the why of this. Um, uh, and, and what you do simply proves what you believe. So um, just humor me for a few minutes. <clears throat> OK, so obviously um, with a project like this, you start off with the triple bottom line framework. Uh, and that's, that's pretty, um, um, pretty common in, in sustainability projects. Um, uh, what I'm going to talk about, the lens I'm going to talk about this project through um, is the social sustainability side of the project, because I think that's what sets eco-villages apart from some other project types. Um, so um, that's what I'll be focusing on in this journey. So um, in order to uh, create community, um, I say we need to start to create culture change. Um, and how do, you, how do you sort of do that? So um, I think we've been thinking about this topic for a while, probably 30 or 40 years, trying to figure out how to connect people up um, with the physical design of our communities uh, to varying successes. Um, so in, in this, in this um, presentation, I'll be talking about three sort of culture change themes that I think are, uh, are ones that we're trying to promote um, with the way that we've set up the eco-village. So the first one is, moving people from the sense of a mindset of isolation to a, a mindset of connection. And these are a little bit esoteric, but I'll, I'll unpack these in, in a later slide. The second one is a mindset of scarcity to abundance. And the third one that builds on these is a mindset of extraction from the land to a stewardship of the land. Uh, and that's the sort of bigger picture that makes the biggest difference. So I'm going to start by going way back in human history. Okay, so. My understanding is that Homo sapiens have been on the planet approximately 2 million years. Um, and so each of those people represents about 10,000 years of human history. Um, and you might notice that there's a lot more white bubbles than black bubbles there. Uh, and, and the black bubble represents 10,000, 12,000 years of human history since the advent of agriculture. Okay? And that was generally understood to be a turning point in the way that we live. Um, so it just gives you a sense of the scale of, um, of time. Of, of how long we've lived in what manner. And obviously the way that hunter-gatherers lived was quite different to the way that we live now. And so I'm going to tie back some of those themes, but um, essentially hunter-gatherers um, generally lived in a much more communal way than we do now. Um, they, they evolved that way uh, for various reasons, uh, but they're often nomadic. They, they moved around from season to season um, looking for food. Uh, and, and the groups were small enough so they had very strong personal relationships with each other. They had to trust each other and they had to work together, so they had to have those, those interactions and those connections. 
Um, so that, that, that group, um, the, group tri the groups of the tribes, um, that, that basically facilitated d defense against aggressors. It, it facilitated you know, hunting woolly mammoths, um, diversity of the gene pool, all kinds of benefits. Um, even the development of language would have come across through needing to communicate with, with the group. So um, that was how we evolved over many, many thousands of years. Um, and then um, when agriculture was, was discovered or, or implemented at a, at a broader scale, um, obviously that started to change. And I'm sure that all of you that went through planning school know the sequence of how that sort of worked. But essentially, it's um, uh, agriculture creates food surplus. Food surplus frees up some people from farming, and they can do an, work on other things. Um, and, and they create um, other objects that they can trade, pottery, clothing, whatever. Uh, and that trade needs a place to happen. So that started to happen around crossroads. They built up towns uh, and eventually built up cities, et cetera. Um, and so that's where human culture started to change. Now, if you, if you look at um, even in the modern era, um, most people still lived in small towns for a long, long time in that era, even with agriculture. And in small towns, they would have had lots of interaction with their neighbors and, um, and, their, and the people they traded with, et cetera. So a lot of those social connections would have still been present um, all the way up and probably until about the Industrial Revolution, when um, mass production uh, required lots of workers in cities, and people, had, people started to migrate from the towns into the cities, and suddenly they were living among strangers. And they, and they, didn't, they no longer had the need or the, the ability to connect in the same way with their, with their, their neighbors. Uh, and so that was, that was quite a big, a big change. And that's led to what I'm calling the, the loneliness epidemic. Okay? Um, modern living has uh, caused this, us to be very disconnected from each other in the way that we live. Um, some, some of the stats I was looking up as part of this presentation uh, indicated that more than half of Australians feel lonely at least once a week. Okay? And, the, and the various groups that are most affected are the, the teenagers um, and, and the elderly. Um, but even the demographics in the middle, and probably that's most of us, um, we're, we're just too busy maybe to, to think about being lonely. right? And maybe the interactions we have, we might see a lot of people, but how, how deep or, um, or significant are those interactions? Um, so I think even on some level, we're all feeling a little bit lonely too, maybe. Um, and I, I think part of this is, is to do with the way that we've designed the suburban environment. So if you look at, I mean, this is just a, a little snapshot from Google Maps that I just took from somewhere. Uh, it almost doesn't matter. Um, but you can see that you know, the experience of a typical suburban liver, a person who lives in a suburban environment that commutes 45 minutes from the city in their own car, stop and go traffic. They arrive, they arrive at their house. They drive into the garage. Um, and th and this, this house is pretty ubiquitous, right? You've got the double garage. You've got the entrance. You've got the master bedroom. You've got the hallway. And then the back, you find the living spaces, right? That's pretty much how all these suburban houses are designed. Um, so you, you go into your garage, you go straight into the kitchen, um, and, and then that's where you socialize with your family. But there really is no opportunity to venture into this space and no reason to, uh, to actually have any kind of connection with your neighbors. And if you go into the backyard where all the goodies are, you, you be, it's basically walled in with an 1800 color bond fence. So we've, we've completely disconnected all those potential um, connections you might have with your neighbors. So I think the way we design our suburban environments has a, has a big role to play in this. Um, some pretty uh, crazy statistics around loneliness. Um, apparently, it increases your risk of death by 26%. Um, it's as healthy as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Uh, it's worse than being obese. There's a lot of you know, pretty significant health impacts. And it also increases risk factors for things like heart disease, blood pressure, um, depression, dementia. So there's, there's good reasons to kind of pay attention to this. And I think this is becoming uh, more, uh, people are becoming more aware of this issue. So in the planning sphere, so back to planning, um, th the first group to probably start to take a look at this issue and try to address it were the new urbanists. And I, was, I sort of cut my teeth on new urbanism. I, I was working in Portland, Oregon for a second generation new urbanist firm directly descended from Andres Duany and DPZ and, and all the, the Florida planners. Um, so I'm, I'm very familiar with the techniques and the, and the philosophies around this. Um, but essentially, the, the idea is to encourage walkability, to design the streets so that people are more likely to go for a walk rather than get in their cars, give them destinations they can go to, um, and then hope that you can de and then design the houses so that there's at least some space along the street. And then at some point, you might get some interaction between a walker and a porch sitter that might lead to some kind of connection. 
Um, and, and I think it was a good effort, and it, and it was a response to the, what do they call them, the dead, um, the dead worm subdivisions of the 70s and 80s. Right? So a connected network of streets and things did do a lot of good. But it always occurred to me that this is a little bit like if loneliness is an onion, you're only cutting through a couple of layers, right? You're not really getting to the core of the issue. So um, I think these projects have had varying levels of success, but I'm not sure they've been completely successful. Um, so the other, um, the other kind of movement that we looked at in this regard was the co-housing movement. Um, so co-housing projects tend to be smaller in scale. Um, they tend to have essentially a clustered arrangement of, of houses that look out onto a, a common green space. Often that has um, gardens in it, veggie gardens. Um, and there's always um, a large communal facility where you can have shared meals, et cetera. Th these um, started up, I think, in Northern Europe. They're quite popular in Germany and Holland and Denmark. Uh, there's quite a few in the US. I think there's a few around here. There was just a new one down in Denmark here, actually, Deco Housing. Um, I think the challenge with this one is this might have gone too far to be mainstream. I think uh, a lot of people get a little bit nervous not having much of a kitchen in their own house and having to kind of constantly eat and, and socialize with the community. Uh, so I think um, for, for us, when we were looking at the eco-village model, we were considering maybe picking something from both of those camps and finding a way to still have your own privacy but facilitate um, some of that uh, social interaction that we're after. Um, so this, this is essentially the module that we've developed for the eco-village. So a little, a little taster in terms of the, the case study. Um, so the way that this works, um, in terms of the size of the cluster that we chose, it's based on some research that was done in the 1990s by an anthropologist called uh, Robin Dunbar out of the UK. And um, Robin was studying uh, primates and primate brains and um, worked out, and obviously we're primates too, worked out that humans have the capacity to, to kind of have meaningful relationships with, relationships with a maximum of about, about uh, 150 people. Um, so that became known as the Dunbar number, and that's sort of what some of these projects use as a metric to not go beyond, because there's not really a, a point in building a community that's bigger than that if you're not going to be able to make those connections. Um, and in our case, given that you're going to know people outside of where you live, if you want to just cut that number in half and say, well, half of my connections will be neighbors, and the other half might be work colleagues or other people I know in town, et cetera. So we sort of set the maximum number at about 75 people, which translates into about, say, 20 to 25 dwellings. Um, so we, we use the um, kind of inspired by the, by the configurations that you see in co-housing, where you have the houses looking onto central open space. Um, and, and we've also created a, a diversity of those, of those lot types. So the co-housing tends to be a, a fairly standard small housing module, whereas um, in our case, we've got three different lot types. So we've got larger, um, we're calling family lots. Those are about 1,000 square meters, so quite big by um, urban standards. Um, we've got cottage lots, which are between 450 and 600 square meters. Um, and then we've got uh, the smaller uh, lots that are about 360 square meters that we're calling groupies after the local group settlements down here. So part of it is making sure that there's accommodation for different household sizes and also economic means, so you get that natural diversity of residents. Um, so the, the clustered gardens, so every, every lot ends up having a, what we call an exclusive use garden area. area. This is actually part of the common space, but it's, it's exclusively for them to use, and it's directly outside of their lot. So um, this is one of the main means of encouraging people to interact with others, is getting them out of their own lot onto, into this gardening space, and it gives them an activity to do while they're there, which then naturally they spend more time there and are more likely to, to meet others. Um, one of the other major changes that we did is we brought the public footpath network through the middle of the clusters. So um, there are public streets here, but essentially most of them don't have footpaths along them. All the streets are designed as quite small streets and tight curb radiuses and all that sort of stuff, so there will be a slow speed environment there. But the idea is that um, bikes and pedestrians will largely use the network that goes through the clusters. Um, so this actually brings people outside the cluster, through the clusters, but it's also used by, by obviously, the cluster residents. Um, and the benefit of that is, obviously, you have a lot of um, separation between the vehicles and, and, and the, uh, the pedestrian network. So uh, letting your children go for a bike ride is, is a much, more, much less stressful um, um, thing to do. And there's only certain crossing points where, where, the, where, the, where it crosses the roads. And, and as I mentioned, they're, they're, they're surrounded by public streets. So this could be a, a module that's used on a small site um, with only, say, one or two clusters, or you can actually expand this um, at a neighborhood scale, which is kind of what we've done. We end, we end up having 11 clusters. 
So it, it kind of works at different sizes. So the three themes I mentioned earlier, I'll just unpack those a little bit now. So um, the, the first idea is from moving from mindset of isolation to connection. So um, the low fencing, sorry, the fonts have got a little bit messed up here. The, the low fencing on the backs of the lots um, allow for that visual connection from the lots into the, into the gardens and into the common space. Um, the veggie gardens bring you out into that space, um, into that sort of semi-public space. Um, and then the gardening activity keeps you there, and, and hopefully you'll meet some of your neighbors that are also out there gardening, talking about you know, what, sort of, you know, what sort of tomatoes they're planting, and what, what's working, and what's not working, all those kinds of things. In our experience, as gardeners ourselves, um, there's lots to talk about. So um, it's a good way to get people out of their little privacy bubbles. Um, and so that, that time spent in the public gardening space um, allows for that socializing, as well as the footpaths that run, that run through there. And, and hopefully that'll move people from this idea of isolation into, into more of a, a connecting with others. The, the second theme is about abundance or scarcity to abundance. So we're, we're, we're sort of um, brought up in a culture that says um, you better work hard, you better save money, you know, invest in housing early, you know, build up your superannuation, because at some point you're going to need that, otherwise you're going to be you know, penniless and on the street and destitute. Right? So there's this kind of idea that you've got to work hard to, so you're not, you're not um, in trouble later on. And that's a kind of a scarcity mindset. But I guess um, there's also the idea, when you, when you garden, I don't know how many of you are veggie gardeners, but um, you, you end up with um, seasonal surplus, let's just call it. If you've ever planted more than one zucchini plant, uh, you'll know what I mean, right? Um, so, uh, and, and this, this has a benefit of, of when you have too much, um, you don't want to see it go to waste, it's perishable. So you want to make sure that somebody eats it, even if it's not you. So the, the example we had when we moved up to the Perth Hills, um, we bought a property up there and we, there was an old uh, plum tree that um, was nearly dead, but we pruned it, and the next season it came back, and, and eventually we were getting um, a lot of yield off of it. And you know, the, the first bucket of plums you get, and they're beautiful, plump, you know, sweet plums, and you just gorge on them, and you just love them. And um, the second, second bucket you get, you're going, yep, they're still pretty good. Um, let's see what else we can do with these. Can we put them in cakes? Can we make fruit leathers? What can we do with these? Um, by the third one, you're really starting to get exhausted, and um, you're looking for any any passerby that wants plums, you're kind of giving them away, and you're talking to your neighbors, and you're suddenly going, okay, we need to, we need to. So the mindset changes to, I'm not trying to get paid for these, I just want somebody to eat them, right? And, and it's, a, it's a different mindset to what we're used to as a transactional um, uh, economy that we, we normally live in. Um, so I think um, the idea of, of actually um, giving that, that surplus away, and then it, it creates a bit of an a social obligation in a sense. People want to give back to you. You've given something to them, they, give, they want to give back to you. Even not at that point, but at some future point. So if somebody else has a, a lemon tree and they, they're, they're, they're full of lemons and they have too much, they'll, they'll, they'll bring by some lemons. So you start to get this kind of natural exchange and that starts to build the social bonds between the neighbors. Uh, and that's kind of the next step. But once you meet them and then you actually build that relationship, possibly through uh, exchanging produce of all things, right? It doesn't have to be that, but it, in our case, I think it's, it's gonna, what's going to hopefully work. Um, and the, th the third thing is, is a bigger picture thing. So once people have those social bonds, um, then they start thinking about um, working together. And so the, the middle part of those clusters is, is proper shared space, right? So that's actually needs a bit of uh, meetings and communication and decision making and um, volunteering. And, and that starts to, um, uh, I guess, get groups to start to learn to work together and put that, that software in place, if you will, that we probably had you know, in before the um, agricultural revolution, um, we probably had all those means of working together, but we've lost those. So we'll need to learn those again. Um, so the, the first step is that, that, that middle space in the clusters, learning to work on those. And then eventually, we're hoping that the, the mindset expands beyond that into the, the broader um, eco-village commons area around the, the site, which includes the, the conservation areas and the, the riparian corridors and some of those spaces. And so people get invested in taking care of the land, essentially. And, and start to think about more of a stewardship model. Um, the other side of um, the other aspect of it is the way that we're uh, providing our services, all the all the, the power, the water, um, dealing with our waste, um, the food. Those are all decentralized and local. So instead of assuming that someone else is going to um, make make your power somewhere else, say by mining coal and then uh, processing it into a power plant and then sending you the electricity, and it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. You don't see it. And if, if those landscapes are getting despoiled, you might not even know about it, right? Whereas if the power generation is happening right there, you're going to make sure that it's actually not doing any harm. So the idea of decentralizing those things makes it visible and, and hopefully makes us more aware of, 
of, of trying to be supported on the, the resources that are actually available on that land rather than relying on some, some distant uh, location to send, it, send those resources to you. So we're hoping that that'll be a really important shift um, and, and will we'll lead to what I'm calling generational thinking. So thinking about passing along the land uh, because you're so invested in it in a better state than it was you know, when you got it and that future generations will then be able to take advantage of that. So, um, so that's kind of my, that was my little dalliance in terms of the why, right? So that's kind of why I think this is really important and why I'm so passionate about it. Um, I've, got a, I've got a quote for you um, uh, that just kind of sums this up for me. This is a, an author called Daniel Quinn, uh, and there's a book called Ishmael. I don't know if you've ever read that, but it's a really great book if you don't get a chance. But he basically says, um, if the world is to be saved, it will not be by people with new programs. It'll be saved by people with changed minds and no programs. So I think that culture change aspect is a really important part of this, uh, part of this story. All right. So now you can get into the, what we're actually doing on the site. Let me just take a quick. So the story has to start with, with Mike and Michelle. So this is Mike Hume and, and Michelle Sheridan, uh, and they're the founders of the project. Um, they, um, they've been working on this project a long time. Uh, we got involved two and a half years ago, and they'd already been at it for nine years. Um, and you could tell when we joined that they were um, running on fumes, um, and, and, and understandably so. The, the, the process has taken twice as long that they, as they expected, and it's been twice as expensive and twice as stressful. Um, but they managed, and they persevered, and they got it to where it is now, which is quite incredible, uh, actually. Um, so, so Mike has a property in property development. He's done a number of larger projects, um, one up in Broome and one in, in Fremantle. Um, and he's always um, he's, had, he's had a close relationship with Stan Perrin through that process, and has joint ventured with the Perrin Group uh, on on those projects. And the Perrin Group is is a is a 50/50 joint venture partner with us as well, and that's been a really important part of this journey. I think if we had to rely on traditional bank financing, this probably wouldn't have happened. Anyway, Mike and Michelle met at a permaculture design course um, 20 odd years ago. Fell in love, had a, a mutual passion for sustainability, and um, and wanted to do something big with that passion. Um, and Mike's projects in the past, I'm sure he tried to incorporate as much sustainability as he could uh, for commercial projects. But at one point, he, would, he wanted to really build a legacy project. And that's what this is. So this is kind of all of um, their aspirations for uh, what they thought they could do with, with a land development and a new community um, packaged into one. So um, it's been a, a major challenge. But we think we've actually gotten to a point where this is probably one of the most sustainable new communities around certainly in Australia, possibly in the world. Um, so it's, it's a big achievement. Um, so yeah, when, when they thought, let's build an eco-village, they thought it was going to be a fairly short and sharp process. All of the things that we're doing align with the, the nice motherhood statements, what you see at the agencies. So we thought it should be straightforward. But unfortunately, any time you want to go the different way, the, the non-deemed comply process, if you will, uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it's harder, unfortunately. But we've learned a lot in the process, and hopefully, um, we're now demonstrating commercial success, and um, we're hoping that other developers will now take note and potentially look at at least incorporating some of these elements into their projects, which would be, would be great. OK, so the project itself, it's about seven kilometers south of Margs, a uh, little town of Witchcliffe. Um, when, when Mike and Michelle were looking for a site, they had a number of criteria, and one of those was that it be directly adjacent to a town site. We didn't want it to be um, out in the boonies somewhere as a kind of eco-enclave. Um, so we want to actually build up a town. So um, it fit the criteria that, for that. Um, Witchcliffe is, um, at the moment, quite a small little place, but it's got a, a really quirky, interesting character. Um, it's got some, um, you know, it's got a, an e-bike shop, and it's got a nice little cafe, and it's got some old buildings there that have been fixed up, and there's, there's good plans, and, and there's a particular quirky culture there, which we, which we like. Um, it's also not far to Redgate Beach. It's about 10 minutes um, uh, down the road to Redgate Beach. And, um, and obviously in the, the catchment, school catchment for Margaret River. Um, so when, when they found the site, um, they also wanted to make sure that it was a cleared site. It's not a good look if you're clearing a bunch of bush to build an eco-village. So um, th this, uh, this site was um, originally was a Cape Mantel Winery, the southern part. And the northern part uh, was a, a hobby farm, a beef hobby farm that was, was done, uh, I think, with organic principles in mind. So it was, it was um, well to look after land. Um, the other part was that it um, needed to have good water, so good water catchment, water, good waterfall, uh, and decent soil. Um, so this kind of fit the bill, and, uh, and, and, and away they went. So they bought the, the, they bought the land with the parent group, 
as a joint venture partnership and, um, and started to do the planning work. So um, I'm just going to run through a series of quick diagrams that sort of just lays out the master plan and the, the logic behind it. Um, so these will be, be quick ones. Um, so, so, oh, sorry. The site itself was 120 hectares in total. Um, it had one dam on it. Uh, we've added two other large dams in the process. Um, the, the first move we made was um, the idea of having uh, the development basically surround the town site so it was compact. You know, we wanted to minimize that walking ped shed as much as we could. Um, it's generally within a five minute walk, it's probably maybe seven or eight minutes to the outside, but generally it's that kind of um, distance. So it's, it's all pretty walkable. Um, and then the, the balance of the site ends up being open space. So it's, I think it's about 60-40 in terms of development area versus open space. Uh, and that open space comes in different types, which I'll go through. And then, so these are, these are the, the cluster diagrams that I talked about before. So we use these modules, and we, we figured we could fit about, um, about 11 modules on the site. And then still, still leave room for some expansion of the, the actual town site itself. So we had a village center, and we could, we could have some commercial, commercial and mixed uses in there. Um, and also uh, a public oval and a public town, town square. Um, so I mentioned the water. So we, we put in two other large dams, and each of those relates to the existing catchments. So um, the, the ground is naturally relatively flat, but it's undulating, and it has quite distinct catchments. And luckily, we're at the top of those catchments, so we're not relying on water coming onto our site. Um, so we, we were able to design a series of swales um, that corresponds with our road networks and our clusters that basically all the surface water that lands on the site either gets absorbed into the soil or it's conveyed into the dams. Uh, and there's mechanisms also for allowing some water through the dams to, um, to go onto neighboring properties uh, to make sure that those, um, those corridors are, are maintained in terms of the water flows. Um, we ended up with two entries to the project. So there's two entries from Bustle Highway. Originally, we looked at entries uh, from the town site itself, but there were concerns from uh, some residents, and also main roads wanted large intersections, and it all got a bit too hard. So we ended up with a north and a south entry. Um, we've built the north one, and, and, and the project at the moment is pretty much the northern side of that central dam. Uh, and then we've got a network of, of public streets that, that weave between the, uh, the various clusters. Uh, so this is the, these, are, these are the internal gardens and, and the network of, of pathways that runs through those, those gardens, um, connecting up. And there are some on-street pathways along in the village center, but beyond the village center, there, there aren't. Um, that also relates to lighting. So we, we've negotiated basically no lighting in the residential areas, so you can see the stars. Um, and then there is street lighting just in the, in the village center itself. And then around, around the perimeter of the, of the development, there's also um, trails that takes you um, through the conservation areas and, uh, and next to the dams, um, so you can do big loops with your bikes or with your dogs or whatever. So this is the cadastral boundaries. So we're just looking at the lot types now. So this is um, the family lots you can see are all in a, so I should, I should have said before, north is to the left. Um, unfortunately, I know that's not conventional practice, but norm, just because of the geometry of the site, uh, it had to be. So north is to the, to the left. So um, the, the family lots are east-west east oriented. But because they're wide enough, um, and we've, we've have very specific controls uh, around overshadowing, um, we can make sure that, that those, um, those houses don't overshadow the, the next house. And so you get basically unfettered cellular access to every, every lot, every house. So the family lots are east-west. Um, the, the cottage lots are north-south. Um, so these, these have north-facing courtyards and north-facing living spaces that look out onto their community gardens um, and the streets. Um, the streets are back here, so they're, they're accessed from the streets. And for, for a new urbanist, they would look at this and say, what are you doing, right? Because um, th you'll end up with a, with a um, carport and a, and a rainwater tank and an entrance. So we are making the streets as nice as we can. They're nice, and there'll be um, lovely uh, tree, trees planted and that are irrigated, so they should grow up quite quickly. There's swales, and they're, they're quite narrow, slow sp speed streets. But if you're going to critique this from a new urbanist perspective, you'd look at that street and say, that's not a very nice street. Um, they are on just on one side, typically, so that's one thing. Anyway, not trying to justify it, but I'm just saying that's, that's, that's one of the critiques that um, I have heard and, and probably had myself when I first joined the project. Um, but the benefit is you have um, this, this opportunity for the social interaction and the north facing onto the community space. The third, third ones are the groupies I mentioned before. These are the smaller lots, and these have um, a shared access driveway behind and then uh, carports and rainwater tanks here and they have a, um, their main courtyards. Their only courtyards really is facing to the north and, and facing onto the street. So 
Um, we've allowed them slightly higher fencing here for a little bit of privacy, um, but uh, there is that sort of balance between the, uh, the, the passive surveillance and the, and the privacy that we're trying to achieve there. Um, we've also recently, um, we're nearly finished with a structure plan approval to get some medium density um, happening along, uh, along the highway. So these, these lots here, these are going to be, well, R30, R40 uh, is what we're calling medium density. Uh, but these will be potentially what we're calling micro clusters, so smaller, smaller clusters of, of, of single story terraces that look out onto a green space in, in a similar sort of way to the clusters, but they're, they're much smaller. And this will hopefully feed into um, the need for the, there's a really big need in, in the rental housing market locally which I think Shane's going to talk about next. Um, so rentals and, and even more affordable owner-occupier houses. Uh, there's still a remnant from the, um, the early planning, which was the, the larger lifestyle lots. Uh, and that was a requirement from main roads in terms of the acoustic buffering, which we then got around by putting uh, buns along the highway here, uh, which, which has sort of taken that away. But the Shire wanted to maintain some of those lots on the, on the entrances to, to the Witchcliffe in order to preserve, um, I guess, a slightly more rural, larger lot character. And uh, in the center, the very, the very center of the project, we've got an aged and dependent housing site. And we've got a nonprofit house, housing developer who's currently got an option on that and is looking at about 20 to 25 um, aged and dependent um, housing units there, which is really exciting. Uh, we've also got some short stay. So the blue is the, the short stay accommodation uh, units. And those, um, those hopefully will be very popular. And we imagine we're going to have a lot of visitors here. Um, so some of those can be uh, long stay and short stay. Some of those are just simply um, tourism lots. Uh, we've got some mixed use lots around, around the, the, the village square. Um, those are going to be like shop top housing. So basically uh, ground floor retail and um, possibly short stay or possibly um, permanent residence above looking out onto the square. Um, and then the balance of the village center is in blue. Is, is it will be a, a village center zoned um, area uh, with, with some specific uses, which I'll go through in a minute. Um, Around the perimeter, we've got some agricultural lots. So these are, these are lots that you can't actually live on, and you, and you have to be an eco-village resident to buy. But they're one hectare lots that are irrigated from the dams, so there's good water there. Uh, and the idea is to promote um, small, intensive horticulture businesses uh, that residents can, can develop and run. Um, and, and we have a, a food hub that we're planning uh, in, the, in the village center that will support those for with processing and marketing and other, other kinds of things that, are, that you wouldn't otherwise be able to afford at that scale. So we're hoping to make those be relatively viable businesses with high value crops like blueberries or avocados or garlic or things like that. Um, and then we've got the, um, the, the on-site wastewater treatment plant. So um, we wouldn't be able to achieve these kinds of densities with, um, without uh, a deep sewer system. Uh, so so we've, we, we've engaged a private uh, sewer, sewer um, company to come in and, and basically run and manage that. Um, so all of the lots are connected up with, with this um, system. And then the, um, once the wastewater is treated, it's then irrigated onto um, a plantation of, um, of eucalypts that are, that are all around that site. Uh, and that, that basically all the nutrients get, get used up by the, the eucalypts. And then they get um, mulched and brought back onto the gardens, onto the veggie gardens. So there's kind of a closed loop in that system. And that's just what we hope it'll look like once we put all the landscaping in and it's all lush and beautiful. Um, so we hope this is going to be a model community for the, the 21st century. So that's kind of the, the, the overall master plan diagram. Uh, I'll just go into the village center now. So um, we, um, we've got really high aspirations for the village center. Um, we've spent a lot of money on beautiful granite stone walls and landscaping. Um, and then we've surrounded the village center with um, uses that will activate it. So we're hoping to get a a, a small family-oriented pub um, approved there. Um, there'll be a, potentially a cafe um, along that side as well. These are all north-facing verandas and the look out onto the square. Um, we've got plans for a backpackers hotel, so probably a 30 to 40 unit um, uh, modest hotel there. Uh, and then you can see the, the mixed-use uh, sites are here. Uh, there's also a, a, a um, creative hub, which will be like a co-working office space for people that want to work from home or or don't always want to work from home and want to come in and get some social um, interaction, they can, they can use that space. Um, and then there's, then there's the commercial lots, the more generic commercial lots as you're coming in. So um, I think there's 13 commercial lots, um, which are about 1,000 square meters each. And half of them have frontage on Bustle Highway, and half of them have frontage on the internal road here. This is Walgine Avenue. So this is the northern entrance from, from Bustle Highway. Um, so these have plenty of uh, convenience parking in front of it. Um, these have, have some parking along, along the highway, uh, so they'll have to be a slightly different mix of uses. But um, 
we're, we've already gotten quite a lot of um, inquiries around those lots, and we're pretty excited about the, the quality of the, I guess, the, the businesses that are looking at it. I, I think they're all sort of seeing that there's going to be a real um, sustainability focus and theme on the project, and they want to be part of that ecosystem. And I think that'll, that'll lead to lots and lots of new opportunities as well. Um, I mentioned the, pub, the, the food hub is there. Um, that, that we haven't really developed the concept for exactly, but it'll include um, cold stores, it'll include a commercial kitchen, it'll include a, a marketing function, um, and possibly even some shared equipment, et cetera, that'll shoot, suit the horticultural um, businesses. Um, and in terms of the public realm, so the, the village square itself doesn't have any, any vehicles through it. It's a pedestrian-only space. Um, I didn't mention the piazza, so I can't, I'm not sure I can go back, but at the end of Walgun Square, um, we end up with this, this little space here, which we're calling the piazza, which is a, a very urban little space. Uh, it's got flush beams. Um, it's got a kind of grove of trees and then some, um, some big granite boulders and some really lovely walls. And we're hoping to have a little cafe that opens out onto that. So you have this whole different, um, different sort of set of public spaces that um, gives you that variety. So that'll be a, a really urban little space. Um, and then the, the, the village square itself is quite a, a large, expansive landscape space with, with, vehicle, with vehicles excluded. Um, the, eastern, the western side of that is smaller spaces where you might have family picnics and barbecues and things like that. And the, uh, the eastern side is, is a much bigger grassed area that you could have um, uh, on-site outdoor movies, things like that, performances. We're hoping that, that part of the creative hub will have a little stage here that could be used for music performances and things like that. Um, so a bit of variety. And then all, all of these edges around it um, should end up being fairly activated with, with the various uses that, that happen there. You can see some of the, some of the uh, photos here. Um, I mentioned these before. One thing I haven't mentioned as a use is um, we're also planning a, a community hall. And this is a slightly outdated um, version. This actually has shifted up a bit now. But um, we've actually got, that's, the, that's the first building we put in for a DA just um, about two weeks ago. So we're pretty excited about that one. And we're going to be funding that. So that'll be um, a, a community hall that's available to the, um, to the, to the Eco Village community. Um, and uh, and it'll, it'll look out onto a nature playground. So there's kind of this series of urban piazza to village square to nature playground, which suits the different sort of um, needs and, and uses of the community. Uh, that, that's, this is an image of the, of the building that we're hoping to build. So picking up on some of those vernacular key, sort of vernacular character elements of the, of the area, but it'll be a very much a fit for purpose um, building uh, that will facilitate a whole bunch of different community uses, which would be great. Uh, I mentioned the commercial precinct. They're all zoned village centers, so it's quite flexible, but we're hoping to get things like bakeries, butchers, pharmacies, um, and other sort of, sort of permaculture and sustainability related businesses. Um, but also, uh, there's, there's a very big community of artists and, and um, uh, photographers and graphic designers and architects. And um, we're hoping to get the creative crowd in here as well. OK, so that was the village center. I'm just going to do a really quick um, overview of, of the systems that we've got. Um, you could almost do a whole presentation on this. So um, there'll probably be questions that um, I haven't covered. But let me just give you the basics. Um, and there's lots of information on our website too, but you can also ask those in questions. Um, so OK. Um, the, the, the bigger theme with our systems is that they're decentralized. You probably got that from the previous comments. Um, and, um, and that, to me, equals a higher level of resilience, because you can see the systems and where they come from and how they work. And if there's some disruption in a, in a centralized system, that's you know, far, far away. You, you don't have a lot of control over it. So um, we tried to decentralize as many of our systems as we could. So um, there's PV panels in every house. Um, there's a battery in every cluster. Uh, there's microgrids that allow for trading of that, of that power. Um, but it's all basically decentralized. It, we, we do connect to the, the Western Power Grid, so we can sell back to it mostly. Um, but uh, generally, uh, the whole thing is sized so that we're going to have more power than we need. All the potable water comes from rainwater. So each, each person is responsible for catching their own rainwater and storing it. Um, and we provide a bit of guidance around that, but that's really up to them. Um, the surface water, as I mentioned, is collected in, in a series of swales and ends up in, in the dams um, and, uh, and then gets irrigated back out, out onto the clusters and the gardens. The wastewater gravity feeds. Um, and I, I described that system already. Um, and then feeds out to the eucalypt trees. And then that mulch is brought back to the gardens again. And then the food is, is the, other, the other aspect is um, you know, if you're, if you're importing um, asparagus from Mexico, you, know, you don't really know, you know how that's grown, what it's grown with. And, and if there's any kind of supply disruptions in the, in the, in the, in the chain, 
you might not get it at all. So um, the idea of actually decentralizing food production is a really big part of this project, and it, it happens at different scales. Um, I'll go through in a minute. But. So the solar power, power um, all, ha all houses have to have at least six kilowatts of panels, uh, and a five kilowatt inverter, they can have more than that, um, up to, I think, 10 kilowatts of inverter and like 14, 14 kilo or 12, 12 kilowatts as a maximum. Um, and then there's a microgrid that connects all the houses together. Um, e each of the clusters will have one of these um, Tesla power packs, um, and that's included as part of the lot pricing. Um, all the infrastructure basically in the community, community gardens is part of the, part of the lot pricing. Um, and so that basically stores any unused power that's generated that's not used during the day for nighttime use. Um, all the homes have to be electric, so no gas appliances. We're not providing gas. And um, there's also each cluster has some fa two fast charging stations uh, for mostly probably for tourists coming down, down the coast as a place for them to stop and, and re recharge. Uh, but we're hoping that that will actually start to offset some of the strata fees for the clusters uh, and make, it, make, make those more affordable, uh, possibly bringing them all the way down to zero at some point, depending on the uptake. Potable water, so there's no scheme water in, in Wichi, so there's no, really no choice. Um, and I mentioned, so all of the potable water comes from, from the rain uh, and stored in rainwater tanks. Um, we, we developed some formulas to help people understand how much they would need. Uh, and generally, it's about 50 square meters of roof space per person um, and minimum storage of about 18,750, I think it was, liters per person. So it depends on your household size. Uh, and we provide a bit of guidance, but at the end of the day, it's up to them to, to work through that. Um, we, we did a water modeling um, to work through some of this. Um, there's, a, there's a bomb weather station on site that's been there for a long time. So we looked at the last 30 years of weather data, and then we took the worst year, and then we reduced that down by 30% um, just to give ourselves a bit of, um, a bit of buffer. And, the, and those were the metrics that we used for setting the, the water requirements. Um, obviously, households need to specify wells rated, low, low water um, taps and, and uh, shower heads. Um, and um, the, the water from the dams is not going to be available on, on the private lots. Uh, there's an issue with collecting water communally and then bringing it onto a private lot. So um, any landscaping that people want to have on their own private lots, they've got to either get from their rainwater tanks which um, is hard to do if you've ever tried. <laughs> Watering landscape takes a lot of water. Um, so we're encouraging uh, gray water systems. So we're using that household water uh, on the landscaping of their own lots. I mentioned the surface water. So basically all that gets collected in this series of swales. And, um, and those are all uh, planted with reeds and other, other kinds of landscaping. So it'll strip any of the, um, yeah, any of the nutrients and other things that get into it. Um, and they'll end up in the dam. And then they, um, we've got solar-powered pumps that then pump it back through an irrigated system into the gardens. Um, but as I mentioned, it's not, it's not to be used on the private lots. The wastewater system, kind of already gone through that a bit. Um, so I won't probably dwell on that too much. But essentially, it, it, um, it gets it, all, this, all that water and that, those nutrients get recycled back onto the gardens. And then the, the final one was um, there's different, the different scales of food production. So there's the exclusive use areas that each of the residents has uh, that they can. Th and those have been sized. Um, according to the lot size. So we're, we've, we've assumed a certain size household will need a certain amount of fresh fruit and veg. And so we've kind of done some, we have a demonstration garden actually at our office, and we've done, been sort of testing this out, how much space do you actually need for X amount of produce? And, um, and that's, th th that was the experiment, experiment that, we help, that helped us size um, the various gardens that we've um, nominated. Um, there's also verge trees that are, that are um, productive verge trees. So we've got some macadamias and some citrus. <coughs> Uh, and that was an interesting discussion with the Shire about that. We had to basically say that we would take over management of the verges uh, to make that, make that happen. Um, there's the agricultural lots I mentioned before. So those are going to be intensive food production um, uh, lots uh, that I'm sure will lead to farmers markets and other kinds of things. Lots of food will be available uh, through that. And then, and then the food hub that I mentioned, mentioned before. So that's, that's a really quick overview of the systems. Um, I'll just talk about the buildings. So. Um, We've done a lot of work on the subdivision level and the master planning level to make sure that all the houses um, get unfettered access to the, to the winter sun, basically. Um, so we wanted to make sure that that then followed through to the, to the buildings. So we set out a goal to create carbon negative, passive solar, energy efficient houses. Um, and we wrote probably the most, I don't know, comprehensive design guidelines that I've ever seen anyway for a residential project, uh, where it really set out the principles of passive solar design, but also then the requirements of it. So, um, it's a pretty comprehensive document, and it, it's partly educational for people that weren't, aren't familiar with those, those ideas. Um, we've also uh, engaged um, eTool, which is a, a Perth-based 
software company that does life cycle assessment uh, to create a new set of software for single houses. Um, they were, they've been wanting to do this for a long time, and we were, I guess, a good candidate, so we, we ended up pre-funding that for them. And um, so now we've got a tool called Rapid LCA that they're rolling out elsewhere. I think they've started to use it at the city of Vincent, and even the star of, of um, Augusta Margaret River is potentially interested in, in it. But essentially, it allows you to do a life cycle assessment on a single house in about 30 minutes and at a cost of about $50. $50. So it's a, it's a much more streamlined um, and cheaper option for life cycle assessment. So we, we've set metrics around that. So all the houses um, have to be carbon negative in the project. And we can test that through this software. Um, we've obviously got LDPs for the lots. Um, and those set in place the setbacks required um, to make sure that that solar access gets maintained, uh, amongst other things. Uh, and then we've got a, a, an extensive design review process, which um, uh, looks at uh, mostly for the custom houses and making sure that they're in accordance with the, the design guidelines and the LDPs. Um, and then that gets, we, we wrote a letter to them, and then uh, they submit that to the SHAR with their building permit, basically. Um, the, the materials that we're promoting is mostly timber frame housing. Um, we're not allowing brick housing here, so that's a, a bit of a change. Um, encouraging straw bale. We're actually seeing a lot of hempcrete. Um, there's, I think, three or four builders down here that are specialist hempcrete builders. And I'd say within the next three years, we'll probably have the largest concentration of hempcrete buildings in Australia, I'd say. Um, so that'll be, that'll be interesting. Um, we're actually building there ourselves, and we're building in hempcrete, so that'll be um, what we're putting our money where our mouth is. Um, rammed earth is obviously another material that's quite low in carbon, but it's not a very good insulator, so we're saying you can use that in, inside a house for thermal mass, but not for, not for an exterior wall. Um, and then in terms of the sense of place, we really have linked in with, the, I guess, the, the more vernacular um, traditional architecture of the region, rather than going super ultra-modern with, with what we're looking at, um, within a flexible parameter, but essentially we're, we're trying to pick up on those patterns that have, have, have sort of stayed um, consistent for a long time. Because we, we hope that this is a, is a project that will be around for a long time, 100 years, 200 years. So passive solar design, I won't go through all this stuff. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the basics. But essentially having a well-insulated perimeter, having some thermal mass that will absorb the, the sun that you get in, um, having lots of north-facing glazing, um, appropriate shading, all those kinds of things have been documented quite thoroughly in our design guidelines. Uh, these are the local development plans. So we've got a, a different local development plan for each of the, the lot types. It kind of keeps it a bit simpler. So um, we can have um, a consistency in the setbacks uh, to make sure that we're achieving the objectives that we, that we want um, and, and crossover locations and, and some of those things, rainwater tank locations. Um, the architectural elements we talked about. So um, we want to we have these buildings be quite simple buildings. We're not, we're not looking for um, crazy architecture in this project. Um, so We've, um, one, of the, one of the really key things we've done is we've said no hip roofs. And if you ever try to design a house um, without thinking about the elevations and the roof, um, a lot of times the designers will do that and then they'll just extrude it and you'll end up with these really crazy wonky hip roofs. So when we took away the option of hip roofs, suddenly they had to actually really kind of be a bit more disciplined in their design, um, which has led to some, I think, some good outcomes. Um, but it's something that we were pretty, pretty key, key on. And then um, just a requirement for, um, for gable roofs to be pretty steep gable roofs, because that sort of fits in with the, with the local vernacular. So a minimum of 30 degree roofs. Um, you, can do hip, uh, you can do skillion roofs. You can also do um, split gables or, you know, uh, as well. So we're not being uh, too draconian, but we have, we're trying to make this not look and feel like a tr traditional or a typical suburban environment, I guess. Um, we've also required that all the roofing be zinc alum roofing um, across the whole project. So that's one element that'll kind of tie all of the buildings together. Uh, so you have that variety of, of wall material and, and shape but um, all of the roofing will be zinc alum, and also the, the rainwater tanks will be zinc alum, so there'll be a, a lot of zinc alum around. Um, and, and, and the windows, windows being mo mostly vertical, that, those kinds of things. Um, I mentioned rapid, rapid LCA. Um, I think I've gone through this um, detail, in detail already, but um, essentially we're, we're really excited about this. This is, a, I think, a probably a, a, an Australia first anyway, and um, uh, we're, hoping that, we're hoping that over time, if we can certify that all of these buildings are carbon negative, They'll be carbon negative to the extent that we can actually then offset all of the infrastructure that we, that we built for the project. That'll be a, a future project for a PhD to do, I guess. But um, that's the aspiration. I mentioned the design review process. It's a pretty extensive one. We do, we do a concept design review for custom homes. Um, and then there's a formal assessment where they have to give us all of their construction documentation, structural engineering, bushfire, all that sort of stuff as well. Um, and, then, and then we give them a letter that goes into the Shire. But if they comply with all that, they don't need to go through a DA process, they can go straight to building permit. 
Um, and there was a, a lot of questions when we, when we issued our design guidelines about how much it was going to cost, right? That's, a, that's a probably a key issue. And we wanted to give people comfort that they were going to be able to afford the lot that they were buying. So what we did is we, um, we pre-designed um, basically two house types for each lot type. Uh, so we did those in-house. In um, and we put them out to tender for the local builders uh, and got pricing back and then selected a local builder to build each of those. Um, so we were able to then offer essentially house and land packages um, that people could then go, okay, I've got this kind of house, or this kind of lot, and I know that that house fits on it and it costs this much money. So even if they decide to do a custom house of a similar sort of size, they have a sense of the, the pricing. Um, but we've had a really good uptake in these actually. So we, we did these six, and then we also invited the, the builders that we were working with, the local builders, if they wanted to design some of their own houses and offer them up as well, so um, that they could. So we have uh, another 10 houses that the builders have designed. They're also um, in the same cate category of, kind of house and land. So, um, that's been a, a pretty useful exercise. So um, that's, that's really an overview of the project. I'll just give you now a little snapshot of what the current status is, where we're at. So the lot sales we've got, so at the moment we've, um, we've sold out three of our clusters. The first stage has been completely sold out, um, and that's, that's 65 odd lots. Um, at the moment, stage two is, is for sale, and that's, there's only about 12 or 13 lots left um, on that. So we've had a really good uptake, um, and that's really without any kind of um, marketing. We've been collecting um, interest through our website and built up a database of about 2,000 people over, over the years. And that's kind of who we've been communicating with through newsletters and other means. Um, and it's only recently we've started to get some um, media publications, uh, some me media articles and, and, uh, and things like this, I guess, to spread the word. But essentially, it's been pretty much a grassroots effort. And, and I guess for a project like this, um, you want people that are already kind of tuned into this stuff um, to, to live here. You don't really want. Um, uh, people that um, aren't aligned with these values to, to be buying lots just because they're cheap, for example. So in a sense, it's actually been um, fine for us that that's happened that way. Um, and we're starting to ramp up the, the, um, the outreach now. But um, uh, it seems to be we're having um, uh, sales presentations every two weeks or so. And, and we're getting yeah 25 or 30 people at, at each of those um, pretty consistently. So it doesn't seem to be dropping off. Um, so we're about to re release stage three, which will be two more clusters to the north. Um, in, um, in July, probably, July, August, July, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and, uh, and then we've got stages four and five, which are the south part of the site, and that's in for subdivision approval right now with the WAPC. Um, where are the buyers coming from? It's, it's about um, half and half. We have about half local buyers and, and half people coming from the Perth metro area. And we've got then a smattering of people coming from east coast um, and even overseas, a few overseas, but mostly mostly WA-based. And then um, who are they? What are the demographics like? Um, that was an interesting one for us. We were, we were a little bit fearful in the beginning that this might end up becoming like an eco-retirement village, because you know, the easy one to knock off is people who don't have to work, right? Um, what we're founding is totally the opposite. So um, you can see that um, all the different various age categories are well represented. Um, and it hasn't turned into a, you know, the 70-plus crowd is, is the smallest cohort. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, and the biggest ones were um, basically young, young families um, and early retirees, probably the two bigger ones. Um, and those are kind of major life change opportunities, I guess, you, before your kids are in school, you might make a change like that. Um, the smaller ones was actually our age is kind of the um, school age kids' families. Um, and I suppose at that point, you don't really want to be uprooting your family, so that made sense. Um, so anyway, it's, it's quite a diverse, it's quite a diverse uh, crowd, which is great. It's exactly what we wanted. We had a, a community gathering in, in late March um, with all the purchasers. Uh, we had about 80 people there, I think, and, and we put on some drinks, and, and they all brought a plate, and um, there was music, and it was, it was, it was just an amazing vibe, actually, um, just meeting the people that are actually buying into the eco-village. And, um, and there was just a kind of a, uh, um, you could see people just connecting like they were their people. You know, there was this kind of sense that, OK, this is my tribe, to take it back to the earlier comments. Um, so that was really great. And, and Mike and Michelle then got to kind of present the story of the project and the history of the project. And then I think for them, it was a really important moment, too, when they realized that they weren't, weren't the only ones holding the torch, that they could actually pass off the torch to people that were actually literally buying into the project and, and partners now. Um, and, and that's, you know, to, to achieve a, a legacy project like this and to get it to that point, it must be incredibly uh, fulfilling for them. So that was, that was really great to see. Um, I think there's two more slides. So um, the landscaping is, is well underway. This is a little snapshot of the piazza space I was mentioning. Of some of the stone walling, beautiful, um, beautiful granite stone walls, um, and this is the some of the uh, the, the village square with, with the, the turf that's gone down, etc. Uh, and there's quite a big 
quite a lot of big um, granite boulders that we found <laughs> in the earthworks that we've kept in the landscaping. So those, are, those will be nice features. Um, and, and then the, the building has also started. So we've got about, I think, five frames up. We've got maybe 10 slabs down and probably another 10 pads that have gone down. So it's all happening. There's builders on site. It's all getting pretty exciting. Um, and that'll, that'll just intensify, I guess, over the next little while. Um, the last little bit is um, a little video. And I might not go through all of it, but it just gives you, um, I guess, a sense of where things are at right now. Um, so I'll just um, give you a, a, my, my concluding remarks is just to remind you about, about what we're trying to do here. Um, essentially, we're trying to get people out of their little privacy bubbles, right, and, and getting to, be, to meet their neighbors and then form those social bonds with their neighbors um, and then eventually get to a point where they're actually working with their neighbors to um, collectively look after the land and get, this, to, get to this idea of, of stewardship. That's probably the key thing. Um, and if we can make that cultural change happen, um, we think it'll go a long way to addressing the, the loneliness epidemic I mentioned before and also um, drastically reduce our environmental impact. Um, it's really important for us. So I, I guess we, we hope that this message and ideas can spread far and wide. We're very, we're very open source with our information. If you look on our website, there's heaps and heaps of reports and documents um, that anyone can get access to. Um, and if we can encourage the planners and developers um, in this room to um, explore how some of these ideas might actually be incorporated into their projects and other sites, um, that would be, that would just further, further the cause. So we're very open to that. Um, I feel like, you know, working in our industry, we've got, we've got a lot of influence over how people live now and into the future. So um, it's really a, a big responsibility um, that we take pretty seriously. Um, we're hoping that this project can be um, an example that others can use um, in, in pushing the industry into more into, into this direction. Um, and if we can do that, then that'll be a success for us. Um, and who knows, if everyone ended up living this way, perhaps um, some of the seemingly intractable existential crises that are, that are looming on the horizon, um, they may not be quite so unsolvable in the end. Thank you. <laughs>